whether it works or not, I'm or not is sure it, it okay? Perfect. If you're sure it works, no, even better. Right <laughs> okay, perfect. So, uh, hello everybody. Um, as uh, so I said, um, my name is Tim Pavlovsky. I'm working at the University of Tübingen, and I'm glad and happy to be here to um, spend the next couple of. I wanted to say minutes, but it's uh, three hours, I think, so uh, with you. And um, as so I said already, um, I'm going to introduce a little bit more the university. That would be basically the first step. And uh, to show you a little bit how our programs in the bachelor um, work and uh, what might be possibilities for you to come over and explore a little bit more the programs um, that we offer. Um, and then I come to the content, and I hope that the content is that interesting for you that you are even more enthusiastic about coming to Tübingen and uh, being interested about what we are actually doing there. Um, just a very few words about myself. Um, I studied economics at the University of Cologne and sports science at the Sport University, and then I combined both areas of interest, let's say that, and did my PhD in sport economics, which uh, fits pretty well um, in that kind of agenda. And um, after having the appointment of an assistant professorship, so I moved to Tübingen two and a half years ago now. And uh, so since October 2012, I'm working there uh, in the broader area of sport economics and uh, management as well as sport media research and all these type of things what we are doing actually, I also will introduce a little bit my team with uh, who I'm working there, um, will pop up in the next uh, couple of minutes on the slides. So basically uh, we have uh, s four different parts, which seem to be strange because we have three uh, uh, different sections today, but I try to press uh, part A and B within one section, so within the first couple of minutes before we have the first break. Um, and that will be, as I said, about the university. And then I will provide you a little bit an introduction, general introduction, so my view on sport economics. And I hope afterwards you have a little bit a better understanding of why we think uh, an economic approach to sports is important and how that might be informative in general for management, because that is basically why most of you are here. So I assume you're working, uh, you are studying in the sport management program, but uh, probably some of you also from other programs. So um, uh, who, who is from sport management? Could you? So majority, any other fields of studies? Economics, general economics, logistics, something like that? Sports studies, and then sport management. Okay, okay, good. So we come to that, and then um, uh, the question here, you already had any courses, any lectures on sport economics in the more narrow sense so far, or is it completely new area for you? New? No? Economics? Even better for me, because then you do not have any repetition um, on these type of things. And in part C and D, which will be for uh, one consecutive um, uh, 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 hour, so I think it takes around 30 minutes of presentation, then we have a couple of time for discussion. That will be for the second and third part today. So let's start with the university. And um, well, I picked up some nice pictures, I thought, from uh, the university and uh, the city specifically. But uh, since I arrived uh, uh, the day before yesterday, I know that uh, this is not that spectacular for you because you have, I mean, you have the fjord, you have mountains here and everything. So it's very nice living here, but uh, Tübingen as well, um, I would say, but completely different. Um, the city is located in the southern part of Germany. It's close to Stuttgart, just to have an idea. And it's a rather small one, um, 90,000 inhabitants. Um, well, it's still uh, three times as big as Molde, but uh, for uh, major towns in Germany, it's a rather small city. The interesting thing is that it, uh, it's quite mixed cultural perspective. Um, so we have uh, around 130 different uh, countries or people from countries living in that city. And partly this is a reason because uh, we have many students um, who come from abroad uh, studying in Tübingen so far. Um, so each third of those inhabitants is a student roughly. So we have at the moment 28,000 students at the whole university. 
Um, and so that uh, means we have a quite fair mixture of people there. What you see here, the pictures, is uh, basically the city. So we have a nice Neckar front where you can sit on the wall, have a beer in the evening. And as I noticed yesterday evening, the beer is much cheaper in Germany uh, than it is in Norway. Um, we have uh, nice facilities. For example, here you would say that's a nice castle to visit, but actually it's even an institute. So university facilities are inside that castle. That means uh, basically that is a representation for the whole city. So parts of the buildings there, where you would assume that is normal living houses, they are not so. The universities mix basically around the whole city. That's about uh, the first impression, some facts and figures. So as I said, uh, 28,000 students, we have uh, 12,000 employees, but uh, that relates to the fact that we have a couple of people working in the university hospital as well. We have a very diverse university, so many subjects that can be studied there. Um, overall, 130 subjects of different disciplines, um, around 750 PhDs that are finished each year. and. Um, for the international perspective, there are a huge amount of partnerships. Um, as I will introduce in a couple of minutes at the Sports Science Institute, we have uh, much less. So at the moment, 10 Erasmus partnerships. One of them we are proud of is with Molde. And that is one reason why I'm here to somehow activate that kind of partnership and explore possibilities to exchange students coming from Tübingen here and vice versa. About the budget, maybe not as interesting for you, but the last figure may be interesting for you. So uh, Tübingen is quite a popular university so far and uh, belongs to the uh, top 10 in Germany. Um, this is something that we are proud of. So uh, uh, they were successful in the recent Excellence Initiative um, and so gained some financial resources for further exploring possibilities to develop the university. The structure is as follows. Since 2010, we have uh, rather big faculties, so seven at all. And you see here the peculiarity of that university, which has a former, I would say, big um, uh, area of research, and actually as well, which is on theology. So the former Poppe, uh, perhaps Benedict, um, Mr. Ratzinger, he had a chair in former times before he came, uh, became uh, a pop of uh, uh, the Christian Church. So then we have uh, other faculties on law, humanities, social science, medicine, and the one we are working in um, is a faculty of economics and social science. And uh, that forms somehow a very nice environment for us and our programs, which are focused at the intersection between economics, media research, and sports science in general, because you can imagine there are some possibilities for collaboration in that area. Where are we located? Well, in the faculty, we have got uh, different departments. One is on economics, so our close partner for the programs. And the sports science uh, department is one out of uh, seven, uh, out of six uh, in the department of social sciences. Here's some figures about our institute itself. So we have around 60 employees, um, uh, amongst them five professors. I will introduce. Uh, it on the next slide, around 900 students. I don't know how many you have here in the programs in total related to sports. Harald told me you have 8,000 students in total, roughly. Yeah, I think 100, something like that. Okay. Those 900 students um, are studying the different programs I will introduce in some minutes and about the 10 Erasmus partnerships I already um, said something at the very beginning. So here's our department structure. Um, we used to have uh, five departments. Um, the one I'm responsible for is on sport economics management and media research. And the other colleagues are researching and teaching in broader areas of sports science in general. As you can see, biomechanics, education health research, social public health science, and so sport psychology. That's always difficult for me. Um, we have uh, affiliated the university sports, which is important. So there are some possibilities also for collaborations within that uh, very vast area of, of active physical activity in the university. And we have recently co-opted the Department of Sports Science. So that means we have a kind of uh, 
uh, a broad perspective in the sports area. Here we are, that's my team. Um, very nice uh, team. We are working together, as I said, since uh, two and a half years right now. Um, I brought that picture uh, to get you a little bit an idea of uh, those guys uh, working there. And for example, when you are interested in an exchange program, uh, Marcel Fana, who is a postdoc, has a permanent position at our department, would be the person in charge of because he basically structured and develops the programs in sport management. And his counterpart is uh, Verena Burg. She's responsible for sport media research and that total area, so she's responsible for the bachelor programs there. And then PhD is my secretary, as I said, a very nice team. And actually the picture was taken uh, last December, just before Christmas break. So it was our visit uh, of a basketball game in Tübingen. They are playing in the first division and uh, it was somehow our Christmas celebration there. So uh, nice, nice event. Actually what we are doing is uh, quite diverse as the topic of my chair might assume. So uh, one core pillar is focus on sports economics and there we are focusing on both sides. Something that is maybe more natural for you which is professional sports. We are talking about and researching and teaching um, about league economics. Something I will introduce in the second part today. And the other one is more on uh, health outcomes and labor outcomes of physical activity, which is, I assume, not so much uh, a focus here in the sport management programs, but which has a vast policy implications and therefore is also important. In sports media research, we do a lot of things around social media, social media in sports, and um, one recent activity that we started two weeks ago when we got a FIFA grant for a program um, or a project where we focus on the TV audience in the US market that might switch or might not switch on uh, games of professional soccer in Europe. So this is something we want to figure out what are the determinants of those guys, people watching or not watching professional soccer because the United States, as you know, the market the people there are not so much focused on soccer. They have other sports like American football, baseball, and so on and so forth. However, um, there seems to be an increasing interest and we want to figure out um, how we could uh, gain uh, uh, some advantages out of that type of knowledge. Coming to the programs, um, we have a physical education program, so basically for becoming a sports teacher, which is not of interest for you. Um, but within the bachelor program, we have or offer three different specializations. So you study sports science, but you can specialize in different areas. Um, one is on health promotion. Again, I assume that is not of your major objective when studying here. Yeah. That's very similar then. Ah, okay, okay. But uh, these are separate <coughs> programs, <coughs> and also those guys studying the profile of sport management and uh, media research, they have basic modules on sports science, uh, educational outcomes, and so on and so forth. So that is con consistent in, in all different programs. It's a normal 180 ECTS. Uh, bachelor program, so usually six semester. Um, and then we have a master profile on sport management as well. This is something I introduced yesterday when giving the lecture um, for the master students um, in Harald Dolles uh, seminar. So today, very briefly, just the structure of both programs. Um, I know there's a lot of information because we have a couple of modules as you have here as well. Basically, the differentiation is between sports science modules, general economics, and some soft <coughs> skills. Um, as you can see here, for the first six modules, we try to consider a couple of sports science topics that you have here as well in your first year. And then you have possibilities to um, uh, decide and select your profile modules, which will be on sport management. Um, and I have some examples on the next slide about the general content of those courses. Um, when you decide to come over 
Uh, actually, we had a long discussion yesterday with Annette. She's responsible for the Erasmus partnerships. And she uh, uh, was basically, uh, she needs the information. And this is something we need to figure out. In which semester, when you come, which concrete courses do you have to take to come uh, along with your 30 ECTS that you need for um, the exchange uh, within one semester? Um, so this is something we are working on to get you within the next weeks a concrete idea of which type of courses you can select. But um, as you can see here, it's basically not only related to sport management. Probably you need to combine it with some general economics uh, uh, lectures and courses on marketing, on logistics, or whatever is offered by colleagues from that other uh, department. The courses, um, though we have um, English topics here, uh, the majority of courses at the moment is offered in, in uh, German language. Um, but we have uh, changed some um, courses so far. So they are right now a little bit more international. So uh, my recent Sportstätten Management, uh, which is a German name, was transferred into tr Sports Facility Management. Now we have a more international perspective. It is in English language in cooperation with the University of Switzerland. Um, we have other courses like Sport Events Tourism, International Cases in the Business of Sports. They are offered by my PhD students also in English. Um, so you find right now an increasing number of courses offered in English. However, those introduction lectures my on sport economics and the one of Marcel Fahne on sport management, they are still in German. Um, so this is something that we need to figure out when you come over. Um, are you generally willing and able to attend some courses in German? And if this is not the case, because I mean, my Norway is uh, despite uh, tuck, I think, uh, means uh, thank you or something like that, I hope. It's, it's right, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's less than poor. Uh, so uh, I would not be able if I would come over to study any course here in, in Norwegian language. But um, maybe some of you um, talk German. I don't know. Do you have any abilities in German language? Learn something during school? Any of you? Who? Yeah. Cool. Ah, great. So uh, <laughs> mother tongue, basically. Um, but in any case, uh, there are possibilities to study, as I said, English courses, which is important um, for you. Now the counterpart, um, uh, the Sport Media Research Program, it is exactly similarly structured. The only difference is that you have modules with a specialization on sport media research and that we are cooperating uh, or collaborating here, not with the economics department, but with the department um, of media research. And uh, the uh, possibilities are similar. So dependent on where you would like to go, where you would like to specialize, you can choose. And the nice thing is, um, we haven't further discussed that yesterday, but I think the possibility is when you come over and you would like to have some courses on sports media research and some in sports management, some in economics, uh, mixing that up is entirely possible, I think. It just relates to an issue which is which type of courses are able to be transferred here to your program. So this is something that uh, I think Geyer needs to, to figure out. So there will be some news in the upcoming uh, days on that. That is, I think, the last slide with some content of the sport media program. Um, as I said, we have some courses which are focusing on um, social media and sport. Um, the interesting thing here is that we also have a couple of applied courses. So for example, uh, Verena Burg, who is uh, uh, running the bachelor program um, in that part, um, she organized together with a group of students um, a forum which was uh, organized together with uh, ARD. I don't know if you know it. It's a German broadcaster. And um, it was a kind of panel discussion taking place for one day in the broadcasting studio of uh, Bavaria. And uh, there were some guests like Mehmet Scholl, I don't know if you know him, and we were discussing about things like which possibilities uh, coaches have in the future, what are challenges for them, because there are a lot of more 
people who would like to be a coach and there is some big pressure in that area and so there was a big discussion around that and also around the financing of the sports system and so that was a topic and the students together with Verena and uh, people from the broadcasters they organized it so we we try to be as uh, practical as possible but also provide a lot of uh, research content during and within these type of courses so that was my basic introduction to our university maybe a little bit longer than expected but still we have a couple of minutes time uh, to come to the next topic but maybe there are so far some questions um, related to university structure institute if that is not the case I would make a, a mental break but would continue directly uh, with my next part um, the next part is uh, an introduction as I said about or into sport economics um, I have some slides to convince you that sport economics basically is a relevant field not only of research but also for teaching and uh, later on for you as a sport managers for applications um, and this is uh, uh, the schedule for the next minutes before we start with the first break so first a short, very short definition. I will spend some minutes on the relevance, give you some examples, and basically I will close with a final slide, which is a structure of my lecture in the bachelor program to get you an idea of how the content I provide you in these uh, examples and relevant sections before are transferred and translated into our teaching area. The first slide is... Uh, important because it's a kind of contradictory discussion right now um, what really is sport economics there is one side of the coin um, which means there are colleagues from general economics general business uh, departments and they are very interested in sports in general why because sports offers a rich set of data rich set of information about players performances their abilities salaries and so on and so forth and what they do is they just take the data and try to test general series. So general labor economic series. And they think, wow, that's a rich and nice area to uh, apply uh, what they learned before in theoretical uh, uh, models. This is clearly nothing uh, which we are focusing on when we teach sport economics. Because what you should get out of these economic approaches to sport is something that informs managers and where you can derive valuable in information to somehow perform and implement different rules, strategic decisions to improve professional sports management. This is something that uh, uh, we are focusing on and this is somehow in the core um, uh, uh, of my presentations today in general. What is sports is also a tricky question and I think the European Commission did a nice overview with uh, that type of picture. Thinking about the sports business in general is uh, uh, possible when you divide it somehow into two different sections. You can think about all business, all industries that are related to sports. So what you need to practice sports for example and to provide professional sport <laughs> games. So we are talking about um, production of equipment and so on and so forth. But even more and maybe more intuitive for you is what you can do with sports later on. So we are talking about the marketing of sport like uh, TV and other media. So uh, you have to make decisions later on when you are, for example, um, negotiating contracts for TV deals. Um, how much money um, is it worth, for example, to broadcast the Olympic Games? Is it really as much as the FIFA gets for the World Cup? Um, for the broadcasting rights and so on and so forth. Tourism is a big area. So people traveling um, to see games, um, not only during events, um, but also when they travel to see their uh, most favorite team on the road. So these are uh, issues and areas um, that are of interest here. Why is it relevant? I don't know if you thought about that before, um, but I have some slides where I try to convince you afterwards that you really think, well, it's a relevant issue 
to have an economics perspective on that. First is some figures about the sports market in general. Holger Preuss, I don't know, is he teaching in the bachelor program as well? Or just, just in the master program? Okay, so there's no problem to cite him and uh, get you with some figures for today to get an impression about the sports market, the business of sports in general. So what he did, he uh, surveyed people, companies, and so on and so forth to get an idea of which numbers um, are for the revenues in general in the sports business. And if you take the active sport consumption, so your expenditures when you go out in the gym, you need shoes, you need your jerseys, you need a ball or whatever, records, um, all that is spent in Germany annually sums up to 80 billion euros. Passive sport consumption as well, a big deal. So when you go out, watch soccer games, so entrance fees, for example, when you go here to Molde, would be consistent in this um, type of, of area. So it's somehow a big, big uh, area of revenues that is related to sports in general. Sponsoring. Um, have you had so far sports marketing seminars? Not yet, but sponsoring will pop up during the next courses for sure. And um, there is also big money involved. The interesting thing here is in Germany, um, uh, take home message is that uh, recreational sports, uh, uh, the revenues from sponsoring are double the size as from professional sports, which is uh, not intuitive, I would say, at the very beginning, because when you think of sponsoring deals, usually you think of big clubs in Germany like Bayern Munich and their sponsoring deal with uh, Telekom and so on and so forth. But many people forget about the pyramidal structure and we have 90,000 sport clubs in general at the recreational level in Germany. And so many of them have very small sponsorship deals and they sum up because of the uh, quantity to such kind of numbers. And then we have advertisement of sports good industry and another billion for media rights. So there is some money involved and uh, I would be more than happy if you take home uh, at least some of these figures and if you remember after that lecture 100 billion of euros per year spent on active and passive sport consumption in Germany that would be a figure uh, which might be important for discussion. So we know there's much money involved but uh, not only because there's much money in sports it makes it interesting to have an economics perspective on that. There are other issues that uh, might be of importance. Um, so there are some programs, specifically um, UNICEF runs programs for developed or less developed countries. There are a couple of other organizations and uh, um, other countries that want to foster recreational sports. Why? Because there are a couple of outcomes that are associated with sports and physical activity in general. So it is said, for example, that there are some values that active people, active <laughs> children can derive out of um, sports and physical activity. And so uh, there seems to be an issue and something that governments generally and also um, international organizations wants to have. And also when we think about a more narrow perspective, um, what about professional sports uh, in general? And there seems to be also some effects on consumers, on fans, um, that is derived out of watching, out of uh, following professional sports in general. Um, I don't know if you all follow the World Cup, probably yes. Um, probably you were more or less neutral spectators or do you have a team that where you would be interested in <coughs> winning the World Cup? Which one you said? On Germany? Okay, so basically you can um, understand a little bit better than maybe others who did not uh, why and how the Germans might have felt after the World Cup was won. So there is some discussion about whether big sport events and success at sport events like winning gold medals and so on has an effect on fans and spectators. And around that kind of arguments there is a kind of agenda in <coughs> the different countries like in Germany, which says that the governments should spend and foster and subsidize sports. The reasons why they do so 
were picked up on the slide before. And so what they do actually is they try to provide an environment with funding sport facilities and various other aspects that might be able to um, uh, get people involved in sports and continue sports. So we estimated for 2010 that the overall money in Germany which is spent from the public officials and the governments at the different levels sums up to 10 billion euros. So quite a bit, it's nearly 1% of the overall expenditures per year which is spent on funding fostering sports in general, which is a considerable number. But there are not only good sides of sports which might need to have uh, or might require an international or economics perspective on that. There are a couple of threats. Who is interested of you in soccer in general, watching soccer, international soccer? Uh, majority, nice. So probably you came up with a discussion um, in the media about the considerable depths going on in uh, a professional soccer in general. So it was estimated around at uh, 3 billion of euros and this is something strange. So uh, if you consider other sectors, other industries, um, you would never end up with companies who make year after year considerable losses. That would just not be possible because these companies would drop out of the market. Completely different in soccer. There seems to be, at least for some clubs, no budget constraint, talking in economic terms. So they have investors who put more and more money inside and that makes it a kind of uh, dangerous situation because if these type of investors drop out, the clubs run out of money and so that might be that a club in the middle of the season is not able to uh, pay for the salaries of the players anymore which would mean the integrity of the competition is somehow in danger. That is something uh, that needs to be tackled. Another issue, inequality, the second point. Here you have the Champions League trophy and again those of you who are familiar with the Champions League uh, competition know that clubs taking part in the Champions League earn a considerable amount of money. So it was uh, I think uh, last year when the overall revenues that clubs could gain in the Champions League summed up to 1.75 billion euros. And what you can imagine is the fact that clubs taking part, getting this big portion of money in their pockets, have completely different possibilities to pay for salaries, to pay and get different players in their team. And that might foster inequality and this is some basic issue that we are following up in our research and what I'm going to present in the next section after the break. And another issue um, is match, fixi match fixing and corruption in general. I took an example which is, um, I mean, uh, as crazy as it could be of a not recent, it was in 2011, but a very famous bribery scandal. Um, there were two games taking place, um, two international games between Bulgaria and Estonia and Latvia and Bolivia was called a kind of international tournament. Nobody cared about it. It was not broadcasting, nothing. But what happened actually was there was a big amount of money that was bet on the fact that seven goals will be scored during those two games. What happens at the end? Well, actually seven goals were scored. So the bet was successful. How were the goals scored? Seven goals, all seven goals were scored due to penalties. And so uh, that made the officials somehow um, suspicious about what's going on. And of course the referees were no official referees and there was some uh, match fixing taking place. And that is an issue which is of uh, big interest and of big relevance currently for international organizations, specifically in soccer. So FIFA is a lot concerned about that. And that also needs a treatment in economics. And here are some uh, regulations that are a response to what I could or what I have explained on the slide before. So due to the fact that we have inequality, due to the fact that we have considerable dabs and we have things like match fixing and so on, there are a lot of regulations taking place within professional sports. 
So one campaign that you might know is Financial Fair Play, which was introduced by Michel Platini and his team uh, around in uh, UEFA. I don't want to explain it more in depth, but the idea here is that clubs basically are only allowed in the future to spend the money that they earn from the business of professional soccer. That is a good side of the coin. The problem is it only is reasonable or it only uh, 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 is uh, relevant for those clubs taking part in the international competitions. So if you have clubs who considerably overspend, they are just in the middle of the table, they cannot control for that. Another issue is about regulating the input. So we have a reserve option clause, salary cap, rookie draft systems, all these regulations taking place in North American sports. And I will introduce them more in detail in the next section. And all these kind of regulations are based on the idea that they should bring back the balance into the competition. So you take something from the rich club, get it to the poorer clubs, and the hope is that their sportive performance in the future will continue to be more equal. Another idea here is the revenue redistribution of media money. So you might know that a couple of leagues do not allow their teams to sell the rights for the home teams on their own. What they do, like the DFL in Germany, they put all the media rights for the different games into one fund, and then they sell it jointly and they redistribute the money. And the idea behind it is that uh, clubs who would normally get much more money out of uh, individual selling, like Bayern Munich, um, or in the Premier League clubs like Manchester United, Arsenal, and so on, they get a little bit less money. But poorer clubs, less attractive clubs, get a little bit more money. Also the idea to get back the balance. And uh, yeah, there are considerable initiatives against match fixing, as I said before. So you saw a couple of things that make a kind of economics perspective on the sports market, specifically the professional sports market, highly relevant. But there are a couple of other um, peculiarities within sports, which I very briefly um, try to introduce on that slide, which make it necessary not only to think about how we can implement, oops, how we can implement a general concept of economics, and transfer it to sports. But these kind of peculiarities give you an impression why it is important to have a specific view and to adapt and modify general concepts that you might know already from economics to the sports sector. Starting with the first, um, again, it's a formal economics term, marginal utility. You sh uh, probably came across that term. Um, in the previous seminars, the interesting thing here when we talk about active sport consumption is that we are talking about increasing marginal utility. What does it mean? Um, who of you is a um, winter sport fan? Who goes out for skiing or snowboarding themselves? Just one? Two? Oh. That is really surprising for me. So uh, it seems that at least in Germany, there are a couple of more uh, people interested in snowboarding and skiing in general. But what happened actually was I started when I was six years old. And I can tell you I was really a very poor skier at the very beginning. So when the coach says, go left, I went right. I was struggling, and it was horrible. So you can imagine it was not fun. So when I started each day, it was like, oh my god, tomorrow I have to go there. I don't want to go for skiing. So I didn't have any fun at all. But with getting more and more lessons, improving my abilities, my fun and my interest in going for skiing rises. So here we have the interesting fact that the more we practice, the more utility we derive out of that. And this is something that is not usual. Um, for other services. Social consumption, so when you go out for the fitness gym, usually you go out with friends. Um, when you go into the stadium, you like to go out and meet friends. Variety seeking behavior seems to be a strange term, but reflects what we can observe in reality. Um, it means that uh, specifically in the sports sector, people think to to um, uh, try to get different experiences in different sports. How many sports do you practice? So who of you is practicing at least one sport? 
Uh, most. Who does two frequently? A little bit less, three. Also, OK. Um, this is something probably related to age. So uh, when I was young, I was just playing soccer. And then I started uh, also with skiing in the winter season. But uh, during the recent year, I tried a couple of different sports. So I tried kickboxing, kite surfing, golfing, and so on and so forth. And the theory behind it, why I do so, is because I'm seeking for variety. And uh, if we have consumers which behave more similar than I do with increasing age, uh, the sports business has some problems. They need to react because for you as a supplier, it's very difficult to count on consumers who might not be a consumer anymore two or three months later because they just seek to, to try a different sport. Preference for suppliers. This is my uh, favorite uh, part. Um, I have to state I probably do not have much idea of quality football in general because I'm a big fan of that kind of club, uh, FC Cologne, which is struggling heavily during the recent years. However, although they are struggling, I'm still a fan of that club. And this is something completely different compared to other industries. When I go out for buying shoes, even for shoes from sports suppliers, I don't care very much about whether it is a Nike, an Adidas shoe, or whatever. However, I would never buy a jersey or something like that from Leverkusen or Borussia Mönchengladbach. Those of you who know that these are arch enemies with the club of FC Cologne know why that is the reason. However, if you Google fan of FC Cologne, you find that picture and you find that picture. This is horrible, so I put it away immediately, but that reflects somehow that there is a polarization of being a fan. So you can either be a fan of that club or you can hate that club. And there is a kind of big issue um, with relevance for the sports business lying behind it. Think about sponsoring decisions. If you're a company leader of a big automobile firm, you should think twice which kind of club you would like to sponsor because it might well be that you are more attractive for one part of the country, but the other part of the country would never buy any more such kind of car because they say, well, I cannot affiliate myself with this type of club. Common pool resource, an issue that um, is very relevant in professional soccer as well. Um, the peculiar thing is that um, players, this example Iron Robin, are contracted by clubs, but there is a government, let's say a kind of uh, a governing body, in that case a FIFA, who says, dear club, if you want to continue playing in our competitions, you need to release that type of player to the national team whenever the bonds coach wants him to play. That is strange. Imagine another company, another industry, where you are enforced to release your workers without getting paid for that, just because anybody tells you that. I mean, you are still paying for him. And so there's a big controversial debate about uh, which type of money should be involved in that uh, context. Competition is something I can uh, skip. And the last point is very important, and that relates to my very first note that I gave. If you open a textbook in general economics, you find basic models. And each model is based on the fact that companies maximize their profit. When you watch out for soccer, soccer clubs, and even other sport clubs, probably you never find any profit maximizing initiative. So they want to have sporting success. And along with these different objectives, the managers of the clubs behave completely different. And this is something that needs to be considered. There are a couple of examples where you can follow up with um, these peculiarities and relevant research areas. So for example, we are watching out for the effects of physical activity on uh, labor market outcomes, on educational outcomes, and so on and so forth. And this is relevant because there's a lot of money put in those programs, like the Sport for Development from UNICEF, but nobody actually really knows how effective these programs are. And that is strange. So you put money somewhere, though you do not know, you do not have empirical proof on um, how good these programs work. And that is similar, although it tackles a completely different area, professional sport events. 
I don't know how big the debates are here in Norway. I remember, wasn't it Oslo who wanted to apply for the Olympic Winter Games? And I think uh, the IOC was uh, quite happy about that. And I think there was a big possibility for Oslo getting the Olympic Games. But then they dropped out. They said, we don't want to apply anymore. So there seems to be a considerable thinking about what really comes along with hosting Olympic Games, the World Cup, or any other international tournament. There might be good sides, but there are also kind of bad parts of the coin, which means heavily investments. You have to invest in infrastructure and so on and so forth. And it is not clear if that balanced out or if there will be a negative effect at the end. And this is something that economists are concerned about. And that is my last slide. So you can see here basically in the structure of my introduction lecture in Cologne that we try to deal with all those different subjects that I ran through very quickly in the previous minutes. So we are talking about um, uh, uh, recreational sports as well as professional sports from the demand perspective. We spend some time to distinguish the effect of profit versus utility maximizing. We talk about market forms, competitive balance. You will uh, learn more about that in a minute. And then we have a kind of macro perspective and institutional economic perspective. As I said, at the moment, it's in German, but we will continue with that um, in English. And now um, I'm sorry for spending four minutes more than expected, but I think uh, we can also have or continue with a break of 15 minutes. Uh, that's fine with me. Um, I would assume that if you have questions to that, we start with your questions in the next part. So enjoy your break and looking forward to meet you in 15 minutes here.